Hello, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Hello to those online. <clears throat> good not to see you, but good that you can see us. <laughs> Welcome. I hope there's some people out there that are tuning in tonight. We're excited to continue our study in Isaiah. And before we get started, I just want to say thank you to all of you who uh, came out to my dad's funeral uh, and supported the family. It was a blessing to see y'all and have you there. It was really a strength for us. And um, I just appreciate it so much. Of course, you got to see the, the family the way we were, <coughs> and you came back. <laughs> so <coughs> that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That, that, that's agape love right there. That's not sloppy love. That's agape love. But I appreciate it so much, uh, and uh, the family does as well. So anyway, we're going to move on in our study tonight in Isaiah chapter 43. So in our last study <coughs> in Isaiah, and pardon my nasal, I've been sinusy now for a while, and these uh, allergies this year is really getting to me. And so I apologize for that up front. But, but in our last study, we saw the prophetic word regarding the coming of Jesus as God's servant how God would have his uh, spirit upon him. We read even the words of Jesus himself where it said that I'm anointed to spread the good news. I'm called, and, and Jesus came for that very purpose to bring us light into a dark world. And we saw how this word also is for all the servants God has called. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are. If you're an obedient vessel, God will anoint you as well. He will anoint to use you in purpose and in his purposes and his plans for whatever it is that he's called you to do. Because as we come together and understand our relationship with God, it's him doing all the work anyway. So if we're a willing vessel, he's going to anoint that vessel so he can pour through us so that we're not in the way of it. And that's the wonderful news about being a servant of God and being a willing servant is that those he calls, he anoints and he uses and he blesses. And he will be with all of those who walk in obedience to the call that he's placed upon our lives. We saw God's sovereignty in our last message over all creation and all nations. And that's a continued theme through Isaiah. We see the sovereignty of God, how he raises up nations for his purpose and then brings them down again if he need to do so. And he alone deserves our praise and every person, all nations, all people, will bow before him. My heart and my prayer tonight is that we, we hear these words now and kneel before God today. Because to kneel before God at judgment, having not received his son, there's no excuse. And there will be judgment. And we need to be, we need to be aware of these things because we will not have any excuse when we stand there. And I think also we saw in our last message um, about those who worship idols, how their idols are useless and they're futile. They have no, they, there's no life, there's no breath in them. They can't stand on their own. You have to, they, whoever carves them has to carve them legs to stand on because they can't do it themselves. You know, an idol doesn't just create himself and set himself up where he wants to be. Man has to do that, and there's no strength in there. There's no spirit in an idol. It's just a dead piece of iron or wood. That's all that it is. Now this week, we're going to see God as, he's turned, as he turns his heart back to Judah and Israel, uh, speaking to them and how his heart is for them and what he has for them. So let's begin with a, word of, with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for your word. I praise you for these people. I praise you for this church. I praise you for those who are listening online. I praise you, Lord, that your spirit is dwelling among all of us that know you and you're opening our ears to hear what you have for us. Give us wisdom and give us discernment as we go through your word tonight. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So verses 1 through 4, Isaiah chapter 43. But now, thus says the Lord who, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. 
I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. So, tell me your thoughts on these verses. Anything come to mind? Right. That personal relationship. And it started with them. It was a personal relationship. Well, it even goes back further than that. It started with Adam. <laughs> he breathed life into, Ad, life into Adam. And there was a personal relationship with Adam. He walked with him in the garden. It was a conversation between two. And God walked with him in the cool of the day. And that was a blessed time. And then after the fall, God raised up Abraham. And then we have Israel. We have Judah. And he spoke to them now the sad part is in their early history after they came out of Egypt uh, and they were they were now wandering around with Moses they didn't want to hear God's voice they were afraid to hear God's voice Abraham heard and believed it was counted to him as righteousness Moses heard he questioned a little bit to be honest with you hey well I'm not really the guy you want to send you know my mouth I can't talk right Amen. Can I get an amen in this place? Amen. Amen. Well, that's a little too quick on that amen. But Moses, he, he, he tried to come up with an excuse. God said, no, you're going. Okay, but fine, I'll send Aaron with you. But he sent him, and Moses believed God and obeyed God. And he was the anointed person and the anointed one to lead Israel out of Egypt. But when they came to the mountain, and the smoke and the thunder, Israel cowered back. And they said, whoa, whoa, you go, Moses. <laughs> if we see you're all right, then we'll be okay. Basically, they're saying, you know, if, if God's mad, because this looks like he might be a little mad, all that smoke and thunder and lightning and all that stuff, we'll hold back, and we'll let you tell us what he said. And it's so unfortunate when you think about it because God longed for a relationship with them. And he would speak to them directly, but they couldn't handle it, so they cowered back. Yes. Birds and fires mm -hmm. is uh, the parting of the Red Sea. Right. When the when the, the three Hebrew children one is in the, was in the fire pit, mm -hmm. and 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 all through that it says be, be not be not be afraid, mm -hmm. and um and the, and now we put it a personal application. It says that uh, he has not given us. A spirit of fear right and so all of that just came that him to start there and then he has not given us a, a spirit of fear mm -hmm. and that spirit is his Holy Spirit yeah you know so that's what came to my mind exactly and that's a very good point in our relationship with him today he <coughs> gives us that spirit that gives us the peace the calmness the wisdom the understanding he teaches us he counsels us he goes before us and comforts us but all those things are true. And then I also think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through walking through the fire. You know, their clothes were not burned. Right. And so you see all of these things. See, even, even the little things are prophetic when you start looking at them in these ways. God was speaking, said, you will not be burned, nor will the flame scorch you. I'm the, I'm the holy God. So this is how God sees those that belong to him. And this is how he, he, he loves those who belong to him. I was just looking it up. I know names have such strong meanings back in the Bible. It says, you know, that um, and he who formed you, O Israel, for not, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Mm. So basically, you know, Jacob was a surplanter and then he changed to, to God, you know, to Israel and he let God prevail but he called him by name. the name like the meaning mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. well and that that's the personal per personalization of it when he calls him by name and calls Israel by name that's how close he wants to be it's not hey you you nation over there I'm talking to you he wants to say hey United States of America those that this country that was formed on godly principles turn back to me. I want to call you as one of my own as a nation. But right now, it's the church that has to get on our knees and stand before God and say, call our name. 
and let us be the ones to go forth and spread the, and spread the word because it is the church. Now, in, in that, when, when you look at it, see, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's, it, it's kind of like a, a, a shift or something shifted from the nations now to God's people as the church because the church is in all nations all around the world. You have God's church, the holy church of God, alive and breathing in different countries all over the world. Some are being persecuted. Some are in hiding. Some are growing tremendously. And then some over here are asleep. Not all, but some. And so, but, but he's calling the church now as by name. You know, you are mine through my son, Jesus Christ. And this is how he looks at his people. And that's a wonderful relationship that we have. Did you have something, Amy? Oh, I wasn't going to read it, but I'm just I'm, I'm absorbing it. My mind is just racing right now, so I can't put it all in words. But I thought about this is the first that was in the chosen, hmm. the, 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 you know, the miniseries mm-hmm. with Mary Magdalene. Right. Yeah. Um, the other parts that I thought about that God didn't take them out of the fire, out of the water, out right. of the desert. He, he took them, them through. That's right. Oh, that's a good point. That's right, because they went through these flames. They went through those waters. And if he gave every star a name, and they do not have the God Spirit in them like we do, mm-hmm. how important is our, how much ahead of that are, should we even see that we are? We are so much more precious to him. Oh, yeah. And we just throw it back in his face. Mm-hmm. That's right. And it's, and it's sad when we see that. And talking about the stars by name, I saw... I saw something today. They've sent a new telescope out. Have y'all heard about, y'all heard about that new telescope? Well, it went out back in 2021, but it sent way out, like three or 4,000 miles even further out than the Hubble and about 100 times more powerful. And they zoomed in on a star, and the star was just really bright. It's, I mean, of course, it, 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 the Hubble couldn't even pick it up. It's so faint. But I thought of when you mentioned that, that dawn of me, God named that star. That star, mm-hmm. yes. Way out there, and every star around it, he called by name. And that's that's just the amazing realization of who God is. He knows all, he sees all, he names all, and for those who are willing, he calls. And he puts them in a place to do what he wants them to do. But that's how he sees those who belong to him. And then fear not. Fear not. Norman, you touched on that. Fear not. For... I created you, and I have redeemed you. Now, see, that again tells the full picture of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He created, and in all things before creation, he knew who we were. He knew Adam. He knew Adam was going to sin before he ever created and breathed life, in, life into him. Before the foundations of the earth, he knew us. And even then, he had a plan. So I created you, and then after the fall... I redeemed you. This is God. The awesome power of God. And it's a proclamation that in this particular case and in this context, he's speaking to Israel, you belong to me. You belong to me. And that's the way he looks at each one of us. You belong to me. Ruminating on was the, how it says, I gave up uh, Egypt for your (coughs) ransom. You know, I, had, I was chewing on that, and I, there was a there's a verse I forgot where it is in the, um, maybe in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy where it says, "You, I didn't choose you because you were great mm-hmm. in number or whatever. Mm-hmm. He, he he chose God chose for His own glory. He picked right. not because it's so strong and powerful, not because it's so wise. I think in, in one of the Corinthians it says, uh, "Not many of you were wise. Not mm-hmm. many of you, you know, you know right. whatever." I, God chose the weak things to confound the strong, mm-hmm. and talks about the, 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 the humble things to, to confound the mighty. God is picking of us. He bypassed great Egypt and these great kingdoms and whatnot to pick these shepherd these uh, these shepherd people, mm-hmm. these and make them His own. Not right. because of their, their greatness, because of His greatness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all about Him. Yeah. It's all about God, and that's so true. But this is a promise. And he told Jeremiah, again, in Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, or I I owed you a prophet to the nations. (coughs) And in Psalm uh, 139, verses 1 through 5, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. 
You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. That's scary, by the way, when you think about that. You've hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Again, this is, um, this is so relational. It's not religion at all. This is not religious, whatever. It is a relationship, and it is showing us, as God's people, how much he loves us. He calls us by name. He's redeemed us. He created us. And now he knows us. And all he wants us to do is to receive him and be in his presence and love him. That's right, and love him. So verses 5 through 11. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I've created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may show us former things. Oh, I'm sorry, or witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say, it is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. So anybody have any comments on those verses? In the 1900s, the Middle East Jews returned to Israel. In 1939 to 45, the European Jews returned to Israel. In 1988, <coughs> the Russian Jews returned to Israel. And in 1991, the Ethiopian Jews returned to Israel. So there was a north, south, east, north. Wow, wow. That's wow. Great. Prophetic again. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And he's still finalizing yeah. everything yeah. for Israel right now. He's finalizing everything. And, you know, it's funny, you, you hear about these different reports coming out of Ukraine. And, of course, you know, initially, and who I don't know how this is going to play out. I, only God knows, to be honest with you. But initially, I'm thinking, well, Russia's going to move in there, take that just like that, then move into Poland just like that. We're going to do nothing. Nobody's going to think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But they're not moving near as fast as no. they thought they were. No. They're bogged down in the mud. They're not able to take the cities they're going after. The Ukrainians are pushing back a lot harder than they anticipated. Mm -hmm. And even now, which I'm very surprised, but I heard today that even, the, even Biden today announced that they have determined that he has, has committed war crimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really didn't think our country would ever be the first to come out or be one to say that at this point. No. But they, they're declaring Putin one who's, who is who's, a um, criminal. Yeah. And so. This, I don't know, you know, this may be a setup for something else. And this is why you have to be real careful when it comes to prophecy. Yeah. Because everybody, oh, uh, Russia, coming from the north, that's it, this is it, it's all lined up. Man, they're going to be coming down on Israel any minute. But they're bogged in the mud right now. Until God's plan is in place, right. they can do nothing. Right. And you can't discount all the prayer that's going on. Right. That's I right. mean, where'd the mud come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they got missionaries over there. They've got help over there. I mean, the point I'm making is, is that I love to l watch things play out. And when they line up with Scripture and the, Bibli and the way prophecies go, we still have to be real careful that we won't get ahead of God. Because Russia tried, and you see what's happening to them right now. And so I don't know where all this is going to play out. But what I do know is that God is using it for his glory, using it for his purposes. And things will play out according to his plan. I don't care which nation rises up and moves into on another. God is the one that directs, raises up, and brings down for his purposes, and he's got a plan. So 
the comments, uh, uh, as far as this goes, any other comments on these verses before I, before I make some comments on it? And that's very true. That's very true. I mean, a lot of times things happen, and then they're held back for a while, for whatever purpose. But a, but you see something there that you know how this is. This could all come and play out. But in these verses that we just read, we see that God is speaking directly to Israel. He's talking directly to them. He's calling for the gathering of His people from afar, as you just alluded to. They're coming from the north, south, the east, and the west. You could see it. As a prophetical word, as we've already identified, God is, has brought people back again. And we also know in 1948, they became a nation again. But as we read further, we see he's calling them along with all the nations to present their case of self-justification. You know, tell, come, and, come and tell me how you justify what you know. Tell me how you're as smart as you think you are. Come in and give me all of this stuff. And then he says listen to him and know what he has declared is truth and this is the wonderful thing about God he will allow people to mouth off as long as, as he wants them, allows them to do so but when it's time to shut them up he shuts them up and then he declares the truth and that's coming that day is coming where God's truth will be the only truth it is now the only truth that we know but today in the, co in the uh, country and the culture around the world that we live in, it's my truth is my truth and your truth is your truth. My wisdom is my wisdom. You're, you can't tell me what is true or not anymore. There is no absolutes. They've taken all of that out simply by rewriting language. Changing words is how the culture is going about what they're doing. You know, gender now, no, it's not gender anymore. Now it's this. No, it's not that anymore. Now it's, this. it's whatever they want to say in order to justify their sin is what they're putting out there. And God is saying, you've put it out there. But I want you to listen to what truth is. I am truth. And what he says he is declaring is true. He's God. There's no other God. There never has been one before him. There never will be another one after him. Now there will be Nations that rise up and nations that fall. There will be leaders that rise up and leaders that fall. Through history, we've seen it. We see it today. There will be um, prophets that rise up and prophets that fall. We have false prophets that rise up and speak and do that whole thing. And then they, and they, go and they will fall. But when it comes down to it, and the bottom line is, this is God's declaration of his sovereignty. And the word sovereignty with God today is not preached enough oh prosperity and bless me yeah mercy and grace yeah and that is part of god's attributes mercy and grace and we and we need that desperately and are thankful for it but we can't receive his mercy and grace unless we come to the conclusion first and foremost that it was his sovereignty that gave it nobody else could have done it it couldn't have come from any other source so in God's sovereignty, he gives mercy. In God's sovereignty, he is love. In God's sovereignty, he has all of, the, all of the attributes that he has. But the sovereignty of God is he's, the buck stops there. <laughs> and if he has mercy, it's because he chooses to. If he brings judgment, it's all in the righteous judgment that he comes. It's perfect in his all of his ways is the song we sing. He's calling for all people to accept him for who he is and understand that there's no other. Now, that's a big bite to chew on in the culture today who think they basically are their own God or going to become their own God or they don't really need a God at all because they're, they're good enough without it. And now you're looking at this and they're saying they're slapping God in the face on every turn. And God allows it to happen during this season because we are still in this season of mercy and grace until Jesus rises and opens those scrolls and when the judgment pours out. But until that time comes, what he's saying to Israel then and what he's saying to us today 
is accept me for who I am, not for who you want me to be. Not for some imaginary God, not for some idol, not for some gimme, gimme, gimme Santa Claus, not a genie in a bottle. You can't just open the bottle and say, give me this and then cork me back up. God will not be bound in a bottle, in a box, or any other kind of package. He is God. He is sovereign. He is all-knowing. He is everything. And until we come to the point of grasping that, even in the doubting times, even in the times of sadness, even in the times of grief, even in the times of not understanding, even in the times when the world feels like it's coming down on our shoulders, we can still look and say, God, you're still God. And that's all we need to know when we don't know anything else. And a lot of things we don't know. And I know come Sunday I'll be, I'm going to give you a sneak preview, but talking about Paul, you know, we're talking about those who are called. When, when you're called, God doesn't give you all the information up front about what you're going to do. But he gave Paul information that I'm glad he hadn't given us, personally me. You know, go anoint, tell an Ananias, go anoint him, pray for him. Because I will show him what he must suffer for me. Oh, right off the bat. Paul's, Paul's still sitting there blinded, and God is saying, go, go do this, because I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my name's sake. That's, that's right, exactly. And when he met Jesus, he met Jesus, and there was no going back. There was no going back on the road to Damascus. He knew, because even he called out, you know, what, what, Lord, he called him Lord right there, said, Lord, you know, what are you doing? Who is this? You know, and he said, I am the one you're, you're kicking against. You know, I'm Jesus. And, oh, you know, Paul knew when the voice spoke who it was. Then he got the full picture. But God told him, you're going to suffer for my sake. And he doesn't tell us everything up front that we're going to face. And I praise God he doesn't. But I can tell you this, he gives us enough to grab a hold of him and hang on with all we've got. Because if we don't, Nothing that we do or attempt to do is going to be in the right way of doing things. It's all going to be messed up and upside down. But this is God. There is no other. Ex Exodus 3, 13 through 15. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? Well, it ain't John. It ain't Jeff. It ain't Jim. What is your name? What shall I say to them? And God said, Moses, I am who I am. That's what you tell them. I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations enough said <laughs> i am that i am i am the god of your forefathers i am the same god that raised up abraham and called him by name it used to be abram now it's abraham i'm the same god of jacob of isaac he's the same god of every one in their ancestry that he raised up the same god the only God raised them up, called them by name, called them to a purpose, and then used him for his, for his glory. That's powerful. That's powerful. And the most wonderful thing is it's the same God that we serve today. Same God. Sovereign God, loving God, truth, I mean, the truthful God, the only God, he cannot lie, perfect and if we, can, if we can just keep our eye on that and just, just hang on to that because there are many times it's going to get dark. I mean, the world we live in is a dark place. And, and when we face these things that we face and we go through these trials and we go through suffering and grief and all of these things, we have a God who gives us the comfort that he's still the same God. We'll not waver. We'll not back down his truth and his word will endure forever. And that's who we serve. Any last thoughts before I move on? 
I look at verse <laughs> 7, it says, Everyone um, that is called by my, my name, for I have created him for what? My glory. Mm -hmm. Then he goes into 8 and he says, Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf people that have ears. This is the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he's using them even though they're blind and deaf. He's using it for his glory. Hmm. The, the, what the purpose of that was, and it was the bottom of, of nine, it says, let them hear and say, it is truth. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, I, I'm, I'm sort of reading something into this, but I'm not sure if I'm going the right way with this, hmm. that he, he led those that, uh, and then for us too, sometimes we're blind and sometimes we're deaf. Right. And yet he's using us to bring forth, forth his glory. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He will use the people again because he called them by name. They belong to him. Even in their rebellion, he will use them. And that's true. You know, we, in our Bible study last night, we were talking about, um, about the sovereignty of God. And, and we were talking a little bit about how God will even use those who aren't his. And we saw that back in some of our earlier studies. How God used this king and that king to do whatever God wanted to accomplish. They didn't know they were being used. But... It's a different relation. When we have a relationship with God and we're called by name to serve him, to bring him glory, it's a whole different animal because he's, he has enough mercy that when we stumble in our, in, in our walk and we take our eyes off of him, he can still use us and still will use us. And he will chastise. And he will whip us back into shape and get us back in line, dust us off and say, now, say now get back on the path. I still love you. I'm going to continue to love you, and, and, and I have promised, this is what I promised Abraham, that through him and through his seed, the Messiah would come. The Messiah has come. The door is open to us. He loves us the same. He loves us the same as he loves Israel. And, and right now, Israel is in rebellion. They're not serving the God that of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the way that he wants them to. They're not seeing him for who he really is. But they will. The world will. It's coming. It's all going to happen. Even though it's not a theocracy, because the most brilliant minds and the, the advances in medicine mm -hmm. and anything else is coming from out of Israel. The little yeah. postage stamp. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. He's still and using them. Yeah. So true. All right, verses 5 through 11. Or did I already read 5 through 11? I did? Okay, well, hold on. Let me go back to my notes, make sure I haven't said, missed anything here. Okay, I know what it is. I turned my page back when you went back to verse 7, and I forgot to turn it forward again. It's all your fault. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Verses 12 through 17. How about that? I have declared and saved. I have proclaimed. And there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he, and there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. I love it when he continues to, to, to remind us that we're redeemed. The Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. Amen. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, it is going to happen. So any thoughts on these verses? chasing after them in the Red Sea and the horses and chariots all went down to the bottom because the water went, went over them. They, they were happy, but then as soon as they had a problem, they started whining it again. And 
with our finite minds, it's hard to imagine that the God who calls out all the stars can have a personal relationship. And whenever I try to figure out God, um, I and then I say, oh, I'm nothing but a grain of sand in the whole scheme of things. Mm -hmm. I say, are, are you laughing yet? So, mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes it can get to that point, like God's up there just kind of kind of smiling, <laughs> chuckling a bit, there you go again. But we all do it yeah. from time to time. We all do. But we, we continue to see the message of God's sovereignty here. And we see that he will bring down all those who come against him. And we see from history that he brought down Babylon. He brought down Chaldeans. He brought down those who had the ships. He brought down all of that. And thinking of another story, even uh, even some of his own leaders that he raised up, Jehoshaphat. You know, Jehoshaphat humbled himself, sought God. God delivered him from the armies coming against them. They worshiped God. We saw that was a wonderful time in leadership of Jehoshaphat. But toward the end, Jehoshaphat went in business with another nation and built a bunch of ships. And what happened? They had none of those ships sail. They were all torn up. You don't partner with an ungodly nation to grow in power. And that's what Jehoshaphat did. And that's what other leaders would do too. And that's one thing that God called them out on over and over in their history was why did you go for help over here? and not come to me why did you align yourself over here and not come to me and this is what he tells us in the new testament when he gives us the scriptures to do not yoke yourself with unbelievers and and majority of the time when you hear that it is relationships it's talking about marriage it's talking about dating it's talking about uh, men and women and whatever but it also relates to businesses if you're going into business, you do not want to have a business partner that is not a Christian, that does not live by Christian principles because you can't grow together. Everything you're trying to do in a godly way, he's going to counter it. And therefore, the business will be stalled, and chances are he will at some point work you out of it because he's going to get what he wants out of it, and he's going to continue to do that. Um, and we see those leaders uh, and, and, and businesses happening. It happens all the time. But he's going to bring down those who, who come against him. Historically, God brought down every nation that Israel was held in captive. Egypt, Babylon, the Assyrians, Chaldeans, so on and so forth. He brought them all down. But he used them for a purpose to chastise Israel in some ways, in Judah, in other ways to protect them because of everything else going around. I mean, just going back to Joseph himself, Joseph sold into slavery, wound up in prison, then wound up second in command. <laughs> the gift that God gave him, and, I, and, and this is part of this, it, it, it's a big picture, and we know even he told his brothers in the end, he said, you didn't send me here, God did. This was God's plan. So don't, don't beat yourself up. But I can tell you it took a lot of growing for Joseph to come to that place. Because when he was a young man, he was prideful in those dreams. And he was rubbing it in their faces. That's what made them so mad. Even his dad chastised him. Would you talk to me this way? Would you even, these dreams that you have, would you, you consider me that you would be over me? I mean, all of these things, he had pride in the giftings that God gave him. God had to break that pride off of him to be able to use him. So, yes, it was his plan all along, but it accomplished multiple things during that plan. Joseph got sold into slavery for the eventual position he was going to lead. But he also got sold into slavery to break that pride off of him so he could receive from God the ability to do what God wanted him to do and interpret the dreams appropriately, not in a prideful manner. Because if he had went to Pharaoh... In, in a prideful way and arrogantly with that dream. I know what that dream is. Man, I'm gonna, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. You think he would have ever been raised up? No. So God had a big plan, and then all through that big plan, he had little plans that worked out to the big plan. And that's what's going on today in the world that we're living in in our lives. All right, verses 18 through 21. 
Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. The one verse that came to mind uh, in reading this when he said, um, do not remember the former things was Ecclesiastes 7.10. And he says, do not say where were the former things or why were the former things better than these or former days, for you did not inquire wisely concerning this. You know, it's easy sometimes to look back and say, man, those were the good old days. I mean, we, we, well, TV, you know, those were the good old days. You know, the Andy Griffith Show, Green Acres, just simple, dumb humor. No po political mess in all that. They played a little off their times, but not that much. It was just, just humor. It was just well-written stuff. And today, they got to worm in every little political jab they can on every turn just to try to make a point. But we'll say, well, why would, man, those days were a lot better than today. Were they? Were they better? There was a lot going on in the world during those days. In the 1960s, Vietnam War went on. We had the Andy Griffith Show playing while our young men were being killed overseas in Vietnam. And then we had the hippies that came back and they came out, oh, no, I ain't going. And the big rebellion of that generation went on during the time that the good old days were happening. So we can't look. We can find good in certain times and certain seasons, but we don't need to go back and say, oh, man, this was all so much better. What we need to do is say today, today is best when I'm in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Today's a better day than yesterday. Why? How can I say that? Because I'm one day closer to Jesus than I was yesterday. Does that mean that I'm going to have more suffering or less suffering? Does it matter? In the big scheme of things, Paul didn't think so. He was content in all things. Whether they had a lot, whether they had a little. It didn't, didn't matter to him. Can we come to that place in our life to where we can say, today is the best day ever because I've got Jesus today? No matter what's going on around us? Well, in this mind, the answer is no. But this spirit in me wrestles against this mind and this flesh all day long. And we have to submit to the spirit, not to the flesh. Because otherwise we find ourselves upside down. So let me ask you this question. He said, um, I will do a new thing. What is the new thing he's talking of? Any thoughts on that? What's that? By let opening your your eyes and your heart and your ears and mm -hmm. back again to your heart to right. him. Yeah. And somebody's going to come along and say something and you're like, why are they talking about God or the Lord or something? You know, but whatever, you know, that seed was planted and it may come back to you. The Lord says it will somewhere. Yeah. You know, at some time. Yeah, that's right. So the change of the heart. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? The new covenant. Mm -hmm. It's the new covenant. That's that's the, the absolute new thing. All of this is part of that. But it's the new thing. Jeremiah thirty one thirty one, behold.
Okay, I'm back on. All right, for those online, what was going on? My batteries went dead. So I mimed to them like you couldn't hear me, they couldn't hear me either. So you're all in the same boat. We're all in good here. So anyway, um, back, back on task. I don't have a clue where we were. The new covenant, Matthew 26, 28. And, that, and again, it's written upon, it's written our, upon our minds. Yes. Oh, I thought. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. All right. So this is, this is what we have in Jesus. This is the, um, the whole plan that God had for us from day one. The new covenant was to be established. The wonderful thing about what we have today is it has already been established. And we are a part of it. We're a part of it. And that's a blessing that we have. Now, I know that some would say, well, yeah, but Israel and, Ju and Judah, I mean, they, they walked with God. They saw the fire. They saw the cloud. They saw all the part in the Red Sea. They saw all the miracles. Did that convince them? Did it keep them on track? No. And see, this is another thing, too, that's kind of interesting, and, 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 and I think it really it's, it needs to be talked about, and, and maybe today's not the best day to go into depth with it, but you think about Jesus when he came and all the miracles he performed. Did the miracles save the people? How many left and you never heard from them again? And out of the lepers, out of ten lepers, was it only one came back? I mean, so the miracles didn't save anybody. The food didn't save anybody. The miracles were a way that he was proving the power that God had given him that he was the Son of God, that he was their Messiah. And not only that, he challenged the Jewish leaders over and over and over again. And when they come in on the Sabbath and this guy's brought into him, can you heal him? What's the first thing he says? Your sins are forgiven you. It wasn't about the healing. It was never about the healing. And that's why I really sometimes today get a little concerned when we get too wrapped up into these big healing movements and all that because it's all about the healings. It's not, we get, let's get back to Jesus. He's the one that brought forth the power to heal. He raised himself from the dead. He sits now at the right hand of the Father. He gives us the Holy Spirit. Does healing or do healing still take place? Absolutely they take place. But they're not taking place so that we can all glorify in the healing. Because any healing that you get today is not going to last forever. Unless Jesus comes back, you can be healed today and die tomorrow or something else. So it's not about that. And so we need to make sure that we don't get wrapped up in the things of God, the gifts, the, uh, all of those things. That's not what's important. What's important is our relationship with Jesus Christ in this new covenant that God gave us through his son. Walking in that, and we're obedient in that, the gifts will come. They will come according to the power of the Holy Spirit and how he sees fit. And what a wonderful thing that is. That, we, that takes it off of us, doesn't it? Hallelujah. If he gives me a gift to speak in tongues, I'll speak it. He'll give an interpreter too. He can give the gift of healing. Gift of prophecy, word of knowledge, all of these are alive and well today in the power of the Holy Spirit, but it should never be the focus. It's always got to come back to Jesus. The new covenant, which he prophesied we would have, as we're reading tonight. Now, verses 20 through 22 through 28, we're going to wrap up. Because after all of this, he's telling how much he loves them. He's calling by name. He's going to protect them. He's going to be there. He's going to hold them. But then listen to this, verse 22 through 28. But you have not called upon me, O Jacob, and have not been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me the sheep for your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not caused you to serve with grain offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have bought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Why? Because he promised that he would. 
he honors his own word for his own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. This is another call to them. Put me in remembrance. Bring me back into your mind and your heart and remember who I am. Remember what I've done for you. Remember the covenant that I have. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. And then he goes on, state your case that you may be acquitted. Your first father sinned, and your mediators have transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of this sanctuary, and I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to the reproaches. Wow, what a sad ending on a, on a note of calling them his own. But they would not hear. They would not reach out to him. They would not call him their God. They would not put them or put him in their remembrance. Now, the wonderful news that we have is that upon repentance, we're welcome back. And even when we fall, and we do, and we stumble, we don't have the curse to deal with. But we still have to, con- we have to get back on our knees. We have to get our heart right with God. We have to be a- in repentance. And we have to put him back in the proper place in our life, which is the head of all things. And, and the sovereignty of who he is. But this is where Israel wound up. And, wound, and where Jacob wound up, Israel and Judah both, they wound up separated. And they were, they were sent out. They were cast all over the world for years and years and years. But, but God, (laughs) he's brought them back together and he will save the remnant. It's a promise. He's not turned his back on Israel, but they had to go through all of this because of their rebellion. Any last thoughts or anything on these, on these verses? Did when listening to God, he was an obedient servant. The one mistake he made kept him out of the promised land. Yeah. One mistake. Yeah. And it was pride. Mm-hmm. Disobedience and pride. Disobedience and pride. Think of everything he did. Yeah. Must we bring forth water from this rock? Yes, we. Yeah. We. Who's this we business? Yeah. You know? Yes. And he didn't speak to the rock. He yeah. whacked it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, the thing was, he really whacked it the first time, so surely it'll work again, you know. He wasn't listening to God in that moment in his pride. Right. You're right. Because he did that. That, that promised him. land that since Abraham yeah. promised to them, he knew it. Mm-hmm. And 40 years they wandered together. And he never, he got to look at it from yeah. afar, but that was it. You know? Yeah. Um, one thing that jumped out at me was the, uh, the fact that um, no, all of the, the good works that we do, all of the going to churches type things and charities or what so forth and so on, um, <coughs> It doesn't matter to God because what God r- or cares about is a repented heart, mm-hmm. and um, and then when we repent and c- you know agree with Him that we rebelled, mm-hmm. the cool, the, I mean, He says that He does not remember them anymore; they're blotted out. Right. And and so when we bring it up ourselves, we're taking control back from God and saying, mm-hmm. "But I can't forgive myself for this." You know, but, you know, we're not God. Yeah. So, I know that's what jumped out at me. Mm-hmm. And that's true. And, you know, sometimes that one aspect of what you just mentioned, it causes us the most heartache, is that we see God forgives everybody else. Sometimes it's hard for us to see his forgiveness for us. But even if we can come to that point, we still can't let go of it ourselves. But if God can do it, <laughs> and he has done it, why do we want to hang on to it and that guilt? Well, partly it's just the enemy that tries to keep us tripped up there. But, in a, but another part is sometimes we just feel unworthy. Well, let me give you a little hint and a little clue. We are unworthy. We're all unworthy. But that's the grace and mercy of God. Even in our sin and while we were yet sinners, he sent Jesus. And, and I mean, that's just amazing to me. And so if we grab a hold of that, we can also, in another area of pride, deny 
accepting God's forgiveness because we're too prideful to let to, to come to the point to where he would actually do it for us. That's pride within itself, kind of in a reverse way, but it, it really is. So looking at all of this, we I, again, I just love to see how God spoke to Israel. He spoke to Judah. He speaks to us with the same words, and the meanings are the same where the rubber meets the road. And that is we are redeemed. We're called by name. And let's remember to walk in that calling and walk in that place and not let the world taint us and pull us away, not find ourselves uh, separated from God in, in a desert place because of our sin or our own arrogance or pride or whatever, but come back to that place of remembrance of who he is and the fullness of who he is, recognizing again that sovereignty and understanding that in that sovereignty comes all the other aspects because he in sovereign, sovereignty basically means that's it. I've made the decision. I am the only one who can and will, and I do. That's what sovereign means, you know. And that's why, you know, you look at it from a government place. We used to be a sovereign nation that pretty much ruled the world. I mean, I'm not saying in the negative we go around and, and beat people up. Of course, that's what they tell us we do. But what I'm saying is, is that we've given a lot of that sovereignty away as a nation because we want to all be liked. And we want to all be on the same playing field and this, that, and the other. The more you give up of what God has given you, you will never be equal to anybody. We need to be giving up on all of that and just getting right with God. That's the answer. The answer for the country, the answer for the world, the church, for every conflict, it's Jesus. And that's what we need, and we need more of him. Amen. Father.